Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Story Storied Sorties. Uh, this is episode 10 and the second or third video of the Easy 8 tank that I'm putting together. I would like to apologize, it has been a very long time since I posted one of these. Uh, the sad truth is I've actually had the video edited together with all the video clips from the model kit building and gameplay that I normally use. But I ran into an issue of finding stories to talk about the M4 A3E Easy 8 Sherman tank because I thought it would be super easy to find stories about the tank specifically. But most of what I found was just about Shermans in general. And most of the stories I found would only say M4 Sherman. They wouldn't say what variant it was. So it made me run into like a roadblock. But then I got lucky one day. I was in Hobby Lobby with my wife picking up supplies to build a diorama for this Sherman that I'm currently working on that you're seeing in this video. And I wanted to do something along the lines of Bestone because um, I heard and read in some places that the Easy 8 first started serving in Bestone. But I couldn't find anything detailed enough to really talk about my videos until now. So while I was looking up dioramas, I came up or diorama ideas for best own or just in general because I think I even got desperate just to get a sh easy eight diorama built something semi accurate I wasn't going for any specific tank or anything just something to give me an idea to build I came across this website called Mike's research it is a military history blog site he says he's been doing this since April 2018 and if it wasn't for him I would be still stuck so I want to thank him for that I'm going to go ahead and give a link in the description down below so you guys can check them out. Maybe we'll get lucky um, and find more websites like this in the future or see he has a lot more to offer concerning military tanks and stuff. So I don't know if he's still going or not, but definitely check him out if you're into reading stuff like this. Now for future videos, I did order M4 Sherman tank books and uh, technical manuals. Give me a little more to talk about in the future. Make it easier for future because this will not be the only M4 model kit I will be doing. So um, it is not going to be the next one. It will not be an M4, obviously. I'm actually working on a B-17 bomber. I already started assembling it because I was I ran out of paint. And with COVID-19 going on and everything else going on in the world, it's been really hard for me to get the paint supplies I need. So I started working on my B-17 in the meantime until I get those uh, paints in that I need to continue the model kit. But without further ado, I'm going to kind of give you guys a brief overall of the development of the M4, the Easy 8. Um, I know we, I kind of did before in the first video talk about the background and development of the M4, M4 Sherman series. But Mike's research goes a little bit more specific towards the Easy 8. And um, so I'm going to read about that before we get into some stories about the tank and service itself. But in his uh, blog post, he mentions that the Easy 8 was the last modification of the U.S. Sherman tank series in World War II. And this specific variant um, had was called the M4 Alpha 376 WHVSS. And the reason why it was designated that way is because it had, obviously, the 76 was, was because it had a 76 millimeter gun. The W was for wet ammo storage, which means the ammo was stored in containers that were surrounded by a well in water and other substances so that in the event the ammo storage of the tank was hit by enemy anti-tank rounds, whether from another tank, an anti-tank gun, or a Panzerfaust or anything else like that, the ammo would not ignite and explode immediately, giving the crew more time to get out or, if need be, kill the target that's attacking them and continue on with their mission, depending how severe their damage was. Another thing that this tank featured was the HVSS, which stands for the, excuse me, the Improved Horizontal Bullet, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, um, Spring Suspension. And that on top of the cast steel center guide single pin double arc 23 inch wide T66 tracks, would, would re, which would reduce the ground pressure in snow and other wet surfaces or soft surfaces when the tank rolled along made it a very smooth and easy tank to ride according and with much maneuverability compared to its predecessors which is how the tank itself ended up getting the term easy eight by the crew i'm assuming it's because it, it was so improved it made it so, so easy to drive the tank and operate the tank 
Now, they did say in Mike's research, they said starting in March 1944, Chrysler will produce 2,617 M4A3 Echo 8s. And that was by the end of World War II. Um, but that's enough about the general history about the tank itself. We're going to go into, excuse me, more about the history of it, um, like it, its service record, if you will. Um, from what I understand, like I said before, what I've read and been able to see so far, the M4, the Easy 8, we're just going to stick to calling it the Easy 8, make it easier for me. <laughs> Easy 8, easier. Easier for me to continue on with this and not keep saying the long designation. But the M4 Easy 8 was actually first saw service in Bastogne to the Battle of the Bulge and um, Battle of Bastogne. It says it was in the U.S. 4th, this one specifically talked about the U.S. 4th Armored Division, Bastogne, Belgium, January, Bastogne, Belgium, January 1945. And the reason why Mike's research is re reading up on this particular unit is because he has got a picture of a Tamiya EZ8 kit 148 second scale. And this is the marking kit marking option one is the U.S. 4th Armored Division and best known Belgium. Now, I have the 135th scale and actually I have to double check to see what my markings are would allow me to do i think it's along the same setup because i mean the only difference between this model kit and the 148 scale model kit is that it it's smaller um it should be the exact same kit just mine's bigger but anyway not that we need to worry about whose is bigger or anything like that but to get a more detail about the shirt the easy eights in the u.s fourth armor division in bastone we're going to start with in i guess in the 19th to the 20th of December 1944, the 4th Armored Division began moving northwards towards Belgium. On December 23rd, the 37th Tank Battalion knocked out a German-operated Sherman tank. Ooh, that was a captured German. And two 75mm SPs near Begonville. Begonville? I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, my Dutch is not perfect in any way. Uh, on 26th December, the 4th Armored reached the besieged U.S. 101st Airborne Division in Bastogne and took up positions around the perimeter defenses. Now, one of the reasons why I'm super excited about doing this Easy 8 and this story, actually, I found this out after the fact. I just liked the look of the Easy 8, and that's why I picked it up and decided to work on it. But what's made me super excited about this kit is one of my favorite miniseries is, and a lot of you have probably heard of this, is the Band of Brothers based on the Easy Company, Easy 8, Easy Company fitting but that's not why i'm excited about it um easy company which was the hunter in the hunter first airborne and they were one of the biggest fights was in best known um it's a sad story i highly recommend watching the series band of brothers tom hanks directed it and it's based off a book steve ambrose if i remember correctly it's been so long since i've read it so if I got that wrong, I apologize. He also has a World War II museum in uh, New Orleans, which was an incredible museum. But anyway, um, and the other thing that makes me excited about this kit is my great-grandfather was involved with Bastogne. Now, I can't figure out if he happened to be part of the Airborne Divisions holding the area or if he was part of Patton's push to liberate the, air the Airborne that were cut off there. I just know he was in Bastogne and he ran into Patton there. Again, I don't know if it's because he's part of Patton's push or if he ended up just being one of the airborne units that were trapped there. Um, he didn't really get into detail much about it. He would tell us bits and pieces about his stories. Um, and the particular story about him in Bastogne or around Bastogne was he was doing a low crawl. And from my understanding, they were doing training. I guess they were waiting to get into the area or something or get out of the area. Um, I don't know what period of the battle this was. And he felt the boot on his butt that shoved him into the ground. And he, when he looked up, it was Patton. And Patton said, son, you need to keep that, I'm going to keep it family friendly, that butt out of the air. And my great-grandfather replied, yes, sir. And when, Pat, when he replied, Patton says, you know where the one place I've been shot in my entire career was? And my grandfather replied, your butt, sir. And you said, exactly. It's because I wouldn't keep it out of the air. So that's like the extent of my knowledge of my great-grandfather's involvement with Bastogne. 
Um, it's like one of three or one of two encounters he had with Patton. So I'm assuming he was actually part of Patton's unit or he just got incredibly lucky or unlucky to constantly run into Patton like that. Again, you wouldn't get into details for it. Um, most of it is because of the bad memories he had from the war. He lost a lot of good friends, went through a lot of situations he's not proud of. And it's also, we figured the unit he was originally is assigned to he was a b-17 mechanic and that pulled out of that to be put on this specialized unit i guess it was a brand new unit never formed before so, and we assume maybe he's just got it in his head he has to keep his secret so which is possible he may be still under um a nda i we, we won't know now because he's long since passed away back in 2010 but Anyway, enough about my great grandfather. It's just kind of giving you an explanation why I'm excited that I was able to find out the EZ8 first saw service during the Battle of the Bastogne or when they came in to free up the uh, 101st Airborne. So apparently, if you ask anybody in the Airborne, they said Patton did not free them. The Airborne already had it handled and under control. Obviously, Patton would beg to differ and say he freed them from the German um, control. But that's uh, time for another story. But anyway. Um, where were we? German units counterattacked around Bastogne, and the last attack began on 4 January 1945, which stalled very quickly. Further small actions continued until 8 January. The German hold on Bastogne was finally broken. The 4th Armored Division received a new, the new EZ-8s. Um, like I said, we're not going to do the whole designation. To replace tanks lost during the drive to relieve Bastogne. Uh, they got a picture, actually, of the uh, some of these pictures are actually what's going to inspire me to do on my dioramas. But the first picture they show of an uh, EZ-8 says uh, that it was brand new. Tank is covered, covering Highway H4 outside of Bastogne, Belgium, on 8 January 1945. The tank is parked at the edge of the field along the highway in a hold down position. It's actually, I really wish I found this first because I've already made my tank look like um, it's older, which actually will probably not work with the uh, Bastogne diorama because the tanks were essentially brand new when they went to Bastogne. But I'm hoping a lot of these tanks had like a lot of snow over them or were painted with uh, crudely with snow camouflage to help hide them from the Germans. Hoping I can do something like that to hide what I did. Or I might just have to repaint the whole tank to make it look newer. Um, that's also a possibility. But this picture is actually really cool, and I wouldn't mind trying to reproduce it. And like I said, it uh, like I just read. Um, like I said, the, art the article will be in the description down below, so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Um, the picture is really cool. It's got a tank with its turret turned to the right over like a mound with some trees in the background, and it looks like it's on a road up against a hill, and the hill's just high enough covered the hull but keeps the turret exposed so the turret can shoot over the mound and it's got some fences and stuff there's a guy sitting in the command hatch or commander's cupola around doing his thing that's why i'm pretty excited i was able to find this link um there's another picture of a new m4 ez8 still has his fenders fitted to the left side the new the crew probably is sleeping inside the tank and fresh snow has fallen overnight and you it's a really cool picture this one's got the tank uh the barrel locked into this barrel lock and there's a lot of snow just like collected onto it that's actually really cool looking and then there's a couple other really cool pictures which is another one when this tank is covered in white camouflage like you cannot see any um green at all pretty much except for the areas they left some of the markings visible so that uh, that's an option i can probably do for my tank to uh to hide up what I've done to it already. Now, the second kit marking, according to Mike's research blog, is for the 5th Armored Division, Germany, April 1945. So this is after Bastogne. Um, up real quick. Uh, the uh, third picture that show I was just talking about that was mainly covered in snow camouflage. It says this new EZ-8 named Black, a uh, Blockbuster Third. Belonged to Captain James Leach, the commander of B Company, 37th Tank Battalion, U.S. 4th Armored Division, in Bastogne. Note the tank was completely whitewashed, leaving only the name intact. I mean, I don't, I don't have any decals or markings for Blockbuster. Um, I might see if I can find more pictures of it. 
to see if it was hand painted or if it was like stenciled. And if it was hand painted, maybe I'll attempt painting Blockbuster on the hall and just completely covering this thing in whitewash um, camouflage. But the next um, part of the story was talking about when we finally entered uh, Germany and it's about the U.S. 5th Armored Division. <coughs> it says the EZ-8 crew rests near the bridge at um, Engermund, Germany. The division advanced 50 miles on 12 April 1945 from Madberg, but was held up at El Eleb River. I'm butchering these names. I apologize. On the outskirts of the town where the Germans blew up the bridge, leaving them only 45 miles from Berlin. On April 16th, the 5th Armored moved to Klotz, where it wiped out the von Klotzwitz Panzer Division and again drove to the Elbe to the vicinity of Danburg. Danenberg. The division then mopped up in the uh, mopped up in the U.S. 9th Army sector until VE Day. So it sounds like for a while they actually just sat around until the end of the European conflict. Because um, uh, for those of you who don't know, we got victory in Europe. Um, I don't know how much longer, but it was before we got victory in the Pacific Theater. So that's why the VE Day and um, I can't remember what they called the Victory Day in Japan. But uh, when we finally beat the Japanese. Oh, there's actually even a film. It's the U.S. Army Combat Action and Advance in Tangermund, Germany, April 12th, 1945. We actually may check that out for future videos about this tank. Um, now, he goes a little more into detail. These are, like, as you can tell, just quick overall historical overalls uh, coverings about the EZ-8 service. Maybe in my next video, I will either talk about the combat action and advance in Tangermund, Germany, or I will talk about uh, more about Bastogne and the just the armored division's involvement. Um, I just want to use this as like a basic layout to let you guys know the EZ-8 saw first saw service in Bastogne and then went on from there to move, roll into Germany. Um, but this one is going to talk about some of the actions that the crew took to help better protect their tank from anti-tank rounds from the Germans. Um, this one specifically talks about that besides the Panzers during the last month of the war, about 70% of allied tanks were knocked out by, excuse me, knocked out by Panzerfaust, Panzerstrecks, or other infantry AT weapons at close range. So it looks like most of the tanks we lost near the end of the war were not caused by uh, German tanks. It was actually caused by German infantry units who had anti-tank rockets and grenades on them. Due to the dissatisfaction of the poor armor protection of the M4 series tanks, many U.S. units added improve, improvised armor to their tanks, and the most common method was the use of sandbags. Uh, I can't remember if this is the article that talked about it, uh, but I remember there was some pictures of, like, Pat. Yeah, actually, it is the article, so let me not get ahead of myself. Um, and the first picture of the show is a crew getting ready to up armor. Um, that's a term that I'm familiar with from the Iraq war, the second Iraq war. We up armored a lot of our Humvees, but, um, I, I wasn't involved with that, but it was just something I was familiar with because it happened when I first joined. Um, they said they got a, the first picture is the 48th tank battalion. U.S. 14th armor division is preparing their tank before da advancing the front in line in Belgium. The divisional workshop already had shelves and frames for holding the sandbags around the hall, the tank. And it's a picture of a guy doing some work on the tank with two two other guys standing at the front, I guess, inspecting the tank by the looks of it. And two guys sitting in the turret, cupolas, or cupolas, sorry. I've been watching that. I believe he calls them cupolas. Um, and the guy on the right is actually just installing, like, wooden fencing the somewhere just to secure the sandbags in place. Um, in fact, he actually links for the 148 scale kit, uh, Edward Sherman sandbag hall protection. So if I decide to go the sandbag route, I mean, I'll have to find 135 protection because I can't do the 148. That's too small for my kit. And the next picture is this one is the first 14th armored division tank with added sandbag armor in February, 1945. 
Bands of whitewash and black camouflage was painted over the OD finish and the sandbags. Now, that would be another cool look to do, I think, personally. Um, but I'm going to have to see if I can find more pictures of this tank. And this is what the next picture is a picture of Patton walking away from one of the tanks. And I, I'm glad that it's still in this article. <laughs> this was the same article because it's, it's pretty funny. Patton was a very eccentric commander and had was very set in his ways and was not... Like, he had no sympathy for his tank crews. And this is, like, one of the perfect examples of that. Um, it's a picture of George, General George S. Patton disapproved of the use of sandbag armor, believing it was not effective and that the extra weight affected the tank's automotive performance, which led to permanent premature breakdowns. An angry-looking Patton just reprimanded the crew of his sandbag co of the, the sandbag covering 14th Armored Division at Easy 8 Painting on the gun barrel was the codes of the tank number 10 of B Company, 47th Armored Battalion, U.S. 14 Division. So it's a it's a pretty cool picture. He's got Patton looking away. He looks sour and angry, and um, you can tell he wasn't pleased about it. And <laughs> he just he was very adamant about how he wanted his uh, units to operate. And one of them he swore up and down was not to put sandbag armor on the tanks because it would cause the tanks to prematurely break down, in his opinion. Obviously, I don't think that was ever confirmed or not, but still, you need to take common sense. More weight on a tank that's already heavy is going to put a lot more strain on its components and engines, but it, who knows if it was enough. Um, I know this uh, video was kind of all over the place to talk about the EZ-8, but I still hope you guys found it interesting and enjoyed watching the video of the tank being assembled. I promise in future videos, they're going to be better edited and the assembly videos will be more interesting for you to view um, after the EZ-8 videos because I've already filmed all the assembly and I'm actually into the painting process, which you don't see here, um, but in... When I get to the B-17, I'm going to be more concise and precise with my editing and uh, filming of the assembly. And it's not just a lot of watching me put the same tiny piece on over and over again and fumbling around. But I hope you guys are still enjoying this video. And I hope you continue to enjoy these video series. Leave a like and a comment down below if you are. Subscribe if you want to see more. And if you don't like it, go ahead and leave a thumbs down. It gives me feedback to let me know i got more work to do. Um, and as you can see in this video, it is not War Thunder footage. This is actually from Tank Mechanic Simulator. And I happened to get lucky and have an EZ-8 Sherman to work on. So I figured this would be a pretty good, cool video to throw together um, to include footage of me doing repairs on a rusted out EZ-8 that was found in the game. And while working on assembly, a EZ-8 model kit. Uh, like I said in the initial video of this, at least I think I said it in the initial video, that this model kit is a 135th scale to me, a model kit of the a EZ-8 in the European theater. Um, I'm not, again, positive what the markings are. I should probably look that up and let you guys know, in the, at least in a future video, because I'm getting to the point where I'm going to start applying decals. Uh, well... You guys haven't seen it yet because I haven't even shown you the painting videos yet. But um, I will go ahead and include that in future videos and hopefully you guys can enjoy that. Um, like I said, if you guys get any feedback either on my model kits, building skills, my video editing skills, uh, or what I'm talking about in the videos itself, please let me know down below in the comments. I'm always looking to improve. I do this as a hobby. It's something that I have fun with and I enjoy doing, but I also want to get better at doing and I'm always open to feedback. I don't want you guys to think that um, I'm just going to throw this out there just because I also do this for you guys to enjoy. And if you guys aren't enjoying it, it means I need to improve some things. But so far, my model kit building series videos are actually doing quite well on my channel compared to my other videos. I mean, I'm not a massive growing channel by any means. Uh, I think my highest video is a model kit video with 136 views and um, they everything below that it's a huge dip. I think the second highest is 17 views and or no, it's 19 now um, with a, the third at 17. And then it's just a we we're in the teens for a little bit. And then we have a sharp decline in video ship viewers. So if you guys got any recommendations or anything you would like to see in future videos, maybe even some model kit ideas, please let me know. I actually have a great big selection of model kits now. Um, I'm about to take a picture of them all and then post them on my Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest. So if you guys are interested, just look for Air Conda TV Gaming on Facebook, Instagram, 
and Pinterest. I will probably include links of those down in the description to make it easier for you to find. And I hope you guys do enjoy. Uh, like I said, the next video is the next video series will be on the B17. It, but after that, if you guys want to see what I have and what you would like me to work on, just let me know in the comments below or on any of those sites that I told you about that you can message me on. Have a good one, everybody.